Hello and welcome. This is Mr. Bob from Bob's Pet Stop In-Home Dog Training. We're giving you a audio dog training lesson. So sit back and enjoy the lesson. In our lesson today, we will be meeting a client for the very first time to discuss some of the concerns that she's having with her dog and the aggressive behavior that the dog is exhibiting. Their first part of this lesson, my goal is to make sure that she understands some of the behaviors that she's allowing the dog to exhibit in the home that is feeding into some of the behaviors outdoors or when company arrives. You will be learning a little bit more about some of the do's and the don'ts and some of the recommendations that I recommend when we meet with families for the very first time in an information lesson. In the second portion of the lesson, I will be discussing with this client what optional training tools that she can use to help manage and control the dog's behavior, both inside the home and outside as well. If you have any questions in regard to this audio CD, please feel free to contact me. My number is 267-994-5390, which is my mobile phone, or you can reach me via email. That's Bob's Pet Stop at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your interest, and I hope you enjoy and learn an educational lesson in this audio series. Today's audio lesson is approximately one hour long. Thanks again for having me out to the no house. No problem. I appreciate you coming so quickly. Sure. Feel free to call yeah. me anytime you have questions. Yeah. She really scared me yesterday. So yeah. I really got to get that under control. Dealing with aggression is challenging. There's so much information out there, and a lot of it's very, very good, but some of it's not, and sometimes we can't determine what is good and what's not necessarily good. Yeah. A couple things. One of the things I love to do when I meet with families is to kind of to talk about, A, the concerns you're having with the dog, mm -hmm. but even, even more than just that, how we can start today cleaning the slate and doing something we haven't done in the past, yeah. something new. Yep. And I think through the idea of starting new habits and eliminating other habits that may be causing or feeding into the problem are going mm -hmm. to be really helpful for you and your family. Many of these things are temporary, but they're extremely important. Okay. Even if we talk about things that don't seem quite relevant to the dog's main concern, mm -hmm. everything is connected to the dog's whole process right. of learning. So what I try to do when I put together these training programs is to identify the concerns, the things that we do every day that help cause the problems. So I will talk about um, some of the things that we, all the okay. things that us, you, me, all people that own dogs do with yeah. our dogs that create problems. Right. There are times where you can correct negative behaviors and then recreate these situations to occur enough times the dog can discern right and wrong right. actions. Right. For example, mother dog's eating a bone, puppy comes near, mother dog growls, the puppy backs off, great. The puppy doesn't back off, the mother responds. And she yeah. responds through snapping or moving or motioning or, or following through, backing up her growl. The next thing she would do is try to nip the puppy. If the puppy does get nipped by the mother and it runs away and she goes back to the bone, that discipline is not dysfunction. So discipline is no more than discomfort. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and discipline is important. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone agrees, you know, a lack of discipline is chaos. Yeah. So when we discipline, we just want to make sure that we're not disciplining over the top too much mm -hmm. or under disciplining. I would probably say the majority of dog owners under discipline. Okay. So I'd like to make sure that we talk about the disciplining yeah. and what that picture is supposed to look like so you don't have to worry about making a mistake or potentially hurting your dog. You don't yeah. need to do any of that. But you also have to go through a systematic process each and every day in order for the dog to learn because dogs do need a lot it's of repetitions, yeah. 25 to 50 repetitions, generally just to get a hold of something. Yeah. And these can be from the most incidental things to the most important things. Now, one of the things I also like to discuss is, let's say your dog has 10 problems. Let's say the one problem is going after people aggressively to try to bite them. Yeah. That's your number one biggest mm -hmm. problem. But let's say we, we learn about the no list that there are other things our dogs do. They may bark and run to the windows and chew on the furniture and whatever. Yeah. 
typically what I like to do is when we eliminate these things is to take the time to teach the dog about all those things that we're no longer going to allow. Yeah. By creating a setup scenario where we repeat something more than one time. Yeah. So let's say you said to me, Bob, you know, we don't want the dog jumping, or now we know that jumping on furniture is generally not a good thing. Mm -hmm. It just gives the dog the power and the position that we don't really want them to have because that ties into aggression. And let's use that as an example. Let's say that you bring the dog into the environment where, let's say, a piece of furniture is or your, your couch, and you place a leash on the dog and you lead the dog to the couch. If you allow the dog the choice to jump on the couch, then mark that behavior through your mouth command. In this case, most people say no. You're making a yeah. mistake, right? Through our action or our ability to follow through and to the completion of contact, which is contact learning or touch, right. the dog will feel the leash. Yeah. Remove the dog away from the couch only to turn around and come back to the couch. How many times would you think that the average dog is going to figure out the jumping on the couch is not what you want to do in that particular situation. I mean, the average dog, probably not that many times. That's right. My dog, I mean, Jack Russell Terriers are very, very willful. Yep. And I've kind of lost a little bit of, like, confidence in training her because she's so willful. Yeah. Think, if you think about it, um, a strong-willed dog, very similar to a strong-willed child. Yeah. So, in other words, your will has to be greater than their yeah. will. But you have to make sure that there's good healthy balance because once the dog trusts that you're going to always get your way and win everything that you do and make it pleasurable and make it fun, it's not supposed to be a downer, yeah. then they're going to be convinced that that's the new order. So, for example, somebody calls me up, Bob, I just adopted a dog, five years old. We know the dog has baggage. Mm -hmm. When I come to the home... That's the day we start training. It doesn't matter what they did yesterday or the okay. day before or, or, or a month ago. We just clean the slate. It takes the average dog about six weeks to completely adopt a new lifestyle. But you're going to see a lot of confusion. There's my little computer going on. Okay. You will see a lot of confusion with the dog uh, the first couple of weeks because if you don't start this day one, mm -hmm. they already start bad habits. Yeah. So I think it's your ability to... To, to win every battle and every skirmish and every scenario when you're doing with your dog, but picking and choosing when it's appropriate time for you to deal with your dog is also appropriate. In other words, we stopped the dog from jumping after three or four times, and when the dog didn't jump, we gave the dog a positive reinforcement of praise or reward, word or whatever, and as we walked away, the dog would receive that. But you would have had to not allow the dog to be able to come back into the room and jump on the couch when he heard somebody outside when you were upstairs or going to the bathroom or out of the room. Right. Right? Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why training is so hard because we don't realize that it's so crucial to follow each and every step. When I give you suggestions, I'm hoping you're going to follow every one of them. Yeah. Does the average person? No. Even I didn't. Mm -hmm. But the more you follow, the more success you're going to have. And... The more tools you use to help you become consistent will also allow more success. I don't believe in one size fits all or one yeah. training technique fits all or this guy or that guy. There's no special trainers in my opinion. It's taking the time to take each individual dog and evaluate their personality. Now sometimes we aren't the right people for our dogs. Sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. I, I, actually more than you'd be surprised. It does happen that people aren't willing or aren't able to follow what they're really supposed to do. They just yeah. want to find an easier out. Or if I don't yeah. tickle their ear and they don't like the, what they want to hear, they want to do something different. These are common. I, I myself am guilty of that. So what we want to do is take baby steps. You'll be able to contact me anytime as you walk through this process, whether it's a phone call or an email. It doesn't matter. I'm always here. I, got, I literally have thousands of clients. I love reaching out to help with them answer those questions anytime they have them. So that would be my intention to do that. Okay, great. If John or Olivia need to be a part of the training or contact me, please. Okay. Uh, the more people are on the same page, the better. Yeah. Okay, so aggressive towards people, but not everyone. Not everyone. Right. And not all the time. So tell me more about that. Um, mostly at the house. Um, people come into the house, she seems to be very, um, very protective. Um, which is, which is very weird because, you know, she's not, she won't, she won't charge the door, you know, she, she understands back and she'll wait patiently at the door, um, 
she it's just sometimes she just is very mouthy. Do you ever try to substitute by putting something in her mouth? Like a no. toy or a she's stick not or interested. a bone? Right. She's not interested at all. Okay. When someone's in the house she's she's like she's like a blinder blinders okay. on. Um are you using a training crate right now? Yeah, she says she goes in her crate. She understands crate. If you say crate, she goes right in. Okay. I notice your crate is open. Mm -hmm. It's very common that people have open cages. What I'm going to suggest to you is make sure you cover the cage. Okay. Because the cage itself is supposed to represent um, a cave, C-A-V-E, cave, yep. a safe place that you can put your dog when you're not training. So one of the things that you're going to learn is when your dog's out of the cage, that's training. And when the dog's in the cage, that's recess, that's quiet time, that's mental breaks. Right. I'm going to suggest that you give your dog at least three to five mental breaks a day. It could be for five minutes. It could be for an hour. Yeah. Dogs do not have a sense of time. They right. learn through association. So the goal is if your dog's out, you're attentive, you're aware, you're observant, or the dog's away. Now, that may be confusing for your dog since your dog may feel, hey, I've got a lot of time out, i got a lot of freedom, it's my new home, all this stuff. That's what's giving the dog the power that's creating or feeding into the aggression. And that's really important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recommend that you put a like piece it. of plywood on top of it. Uh, throw a little bed sheet over um, the three sides because the one side is covered by the, the wall. Well, so you yeah. don't need that. And it's a visual thing, not a daylight or darkness So cover thing. the front door as well? Absolutely. Okay. This way, anytime the dog's in there, they're learning to listen. Okay. When they come out, they're visually stimulate it and learning. Okay. Many dogs that are in an open cage, they could be in there and, and get very confused or frustrated because they can't participate. Okay. Yeah. Okay, especially if company comes in and they're not comfortable. Yeah. Now your dog looks like he's gonna get them, you know, yeah. chew them up. And people so, are very afraid of her. I'm sure you've heard her bark. She has a very deep bark for a little yeah, girl. Yeah, she can be intimidated. <laughs> yeah, people right. hear her and they think we have a Rottweiler and I'm like, no, she's just a Jack Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. So that would be an encouragement for you. Okay. Um, most people, when they use a training crate, usually the training crate typically is used for the first couple of years of a dog's life. Yeah. But about 99% of the people that have cages don't use them correctly. So I want to make sure that you're using it correctly. So if you choose to um, get rid of the cage at one point, doing what we're doing now will help you get there quicker. If you choose to keep the dog's crate for the life of the dog, then the dog will always be using the cage. Yeah, we're either... probably going to keep it. I mean, she, she goes right in it. She and she hangs out in there by herself. Yeah. And, you know, we put her in bed, and she settles right down, and, you know, I say good night, and we go upstairs, and she's in her crate quiet yeah. all night. Yeah, a lot of dogs need it. They, yeah. they require it. And, and it sounds to me that this particular individual probably do quite well with being connected to that cage safety environment for the rest of its life. Let me let me go let me go to my little no list and we'll talk about that and you can start taking some notes here. Okay. One of the things I always suggest, especially to the children, company that comes in when you're out at the vet's office or anything else, you always tell everybody, no reaching or staring at a dog. That can create a very uncomfortable scenario for the dog and they can misinterpret that language yeah. and potentially become very uneasy or aggressive. Yeah. Um, also, when, it's, when your dog is potentially meeting another dog, I'm not really interested in doing any initial nose-to-nose -nose or nose-to-hiney learning. In other words, I don't want my dog trying to figure out life by just going up to another dog and working it out because they could get into a dog fight. Mm -hmm. So what I have a tendency to do is introduce myself to someone or their dog by greeting them and then greeting my dog petting the other dog and then petting my dog. Uh, kind of being the bridge to that experience so I can tell my dog that they're okay. Otherwise, if I stand back and allow my dog to be introduced to another dog without a good gradual introduction, mm -hmm. then a problem could start. Even when you introduce the dogs and they seem to be fine and you walk away, yeah. if you kind of walk away and leave them there and then tell them to come, that could spark a dog fight. Yeah. So. We're not going to worry about why it's occurring. We're interested in fixing the problem. We speculate a lot why dogs do what they do. And many times we can figure out what that problem is when we start to see a pattern of behavior. Just like people who are sick, they're interested in getting the problem fixed more than they're interested in figuring out why it happened. Right? Yeah. yeah. Let's fix the problem. We can maybe figure out what the problem is later. Same thing with, with what you're, you're doing with your dog. 
if if a, if a big dog wanted to fight with her, she would go right into it. I can yeah, guarantee that. that. Yep, that that can be that little warrior in many yeah. dogs that are very very strong. They yeah. they'll go into battle and um, so she won't initiate. But if somebody else did that, she would not back down at all. Okay, well everything that we're going to learn is procedure. So you're not going to put your dog or yourself in a situation where these things are going to fall apart because it's everything done through procedure. Okay. I'm all a firm believer of procedure. I've never had serious dog bites in my career, and the reason is because everything I do is through procedure. Just like I asked you to put the dog away, so when I came to you, I could focus on the information portion of our lesson so your dog didn't have to figure it out. Yeah. So maybe when somebody comes to your home, it might be better for you to put the dog away, bring them in, settle them down, Tell them what's going to happen, bring the dog out, and allow a situation to occur. When they're about to leave, same thing. We can get to the dog and, and put them away or control the behavior. Everything's procedure. And what happens is when you explain that to people, whether you're out on the road walking and mm -hmm. somebody wants to meet you or your vet's office or the groomer mm -hmm. uh, or a company coming to your home, if you take the time to educate them on what needs to happen or what shouldn't happen, you will prevent all these problems from occurring. Okay. Yeah. All right. The next one. No fast behavior. Nothing fast. You probably know all that already. Yeah. You know, I'm preaching to the Something choir in a sense where you know a lot of these things. I want to make sure that we're both clear with these messages because yeah. our reaction towards another dog that's quick and aggressive or a person, even if they're playing, they're over, you have friends over, they're playing with you guys, the dog misinterprets that and feels responsible to go after him just because of the motion or a dog being walked outside and the motorcycle drives by real fast, whatever the case may be, that's huge. Like the, I the desensitized cat. him. I desensitized her though. Because um, I've been home and the cat's had just been out and at first she was chasing him and now, you know, but she just walks by them. She doesn't even pay attention. Anymore. Yeah, that's right because it happens over and over. So yeah. you also find that when the dog does go into a crate and you close the door and you cover it up, all the stuff that happens around here won't bother your dog. You know, it'll be, it'll be perfectly fine. The next one, I'm not a big guy on tie-outs or leaving our dogs outside unintended invisible fences and that type of thing. Probably with you it might not be happening, but just a good rule of thumb. Yeah. If your dog's out, you should be out. If your dog makes a mistake outside and you're not there, or a mistake in the home and you're not there to mark and teach the dog, yeah. then that's a problem. And you want to avoid that at all costs. Here's another one. Don't leave the cage open. Many people leave the dog's cage open and allow the dog to freely come and go. When I would prefer you to control the dog at all costs for everything. When the dog's going to get fed, when they're going to go in the cage, when they're going to go potty. Control everything because I believe the majority of the reasons why dogs have these behavior problems is because we give them too much power and control, too much freedom, too much choice. Eliminate all that. Okay. The more you're in control, the less they're in control, the more they come to you for guidance. Yeah. It's like a child. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah. That way the cage is like a, almost like a reward for her. It is a reward. Way. That's exactly yeah. right. I love your attitude because you think about it. The cage is closed, and let's say the dog wants to get in there. They have to come to you and say, Mom, can you invite me into the cage? Yeah. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Right? And so on. I didn't think about that one, but that's a good, uh, that's a good way to be the boss. One thing I will encourage you, and, and this is beyond the other side of the, of the list, is to always keep a leash on your dog when they are out of the cage. I used to make leashes. I'd go to the store, buy some rope, buy a little clamp, buy a little snap, and I'd make a little leash. You know, I've made metal ones, I've made rope ones, nylon ones, and they have different lengths. The two-footer, the four-footer, the six-footer, and they're based upon controlling our dogs when they come out of the cage. Think about it. The average person takes his dog for a walk on a leash to control the dog. Mm -hmm. That may be 1 to 10% of a day. Very little. Mm -hmm. Come in the house, they take the leash off, which basically means I'm taking control off. And now we wonder why our dog's behavior problems are so different in the home. Mm -hmm. So, in theory, if you take any dog out of a crate and it's temporary learning and it's attached to a leash, attached to a regular flat collar, for dogs that have physical problems, you may need a harness, mm -hmm. you know, there's some medical problem. The dog's dragging this thing around. If it jumps on your furniture or it growls or it barks or it does something you don't want and you're trying to teach it and you want to create repetitions, you're always able to go to the leash. Yeah. 
So for example, the same thing I was mentioning earlier in the example, the dog jumps on the furniture and diving out the door or the window to bark because somebody's yeah. outside. And you're able to mark that behavior and then quickly get to the leash, get the dog off, only to turn around to repeat that again. What's so, for example, if the dog is barking at the window, would you pull them away? How, I mean, how far away do you need to pull them away? All the way away from the window? Well, let's just jerk it. Actually, I don't really jerk and I don't really pull. It's more of a coax. Okay, it right might on. be the combination of the two, but the moment it starts, mm -hmm. if I'm not paying attention and I mark the behavior and I'll say, nope, and I quickly go right to the leash, I get the dog quickly off the furniture, I'll literally walk into the kitchen, I'll turn around and I'll come right back to the furniture holding the leash. Okay. So the dog jumps on the furniture, nope, we're going to do that one again. And again and again until the dog gets it. Okay. The moment they don't jump on the furniture and I say, good dog, and walk the dog away and praise the dog, or say the word treat and then walk away and give the dog a treat, then I proceed to drop the leash to see if the dog is going to go back to the window, or have we just had a successful, great learning experience and ended that on a positive note. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want the dogs to make a mistake. We want to correct their behaviors. We want to find an correction level that's appropriate to the crime. And then, and then create enough repetitions where the dog will understand. So this way the dog knows that, hey, I'm not allowed to jump on the furniture ever, let alone go to the window and scratch it. Yeah. Okay. So didn't mean to digress there. No, Get back okay. to the no list. The, I mean, that's one of the big issues having them parents barking and everything outside. Yeah. You can shut the windows down. You can keep the dog off the furniture. There's lots you of things you can you. do, <laughs> you know. So your ability to, to follow through and get your way Yep. and digest her behavior in little increments of time will give you a tremendous amount of success. I've never been a believer that some kid should be sitting in math class for eight hours or two hours, yeah. yet we do that with our dogs. Yeah. Your dog's only a year old. But even if it was a five-year-old dog that has some behavior problems, or they're hyper, they're overactive, or they don't know what to do with themselves, they need mental breaks throughout the day. Their behavior is telling us that. We just need to observe them more and learn about what we really need to do. Okay. Next, block visual areas like windows and doors to prevent obsessive compulsive behaviors. The window. If you need to block the window and you're going to run in the other room for a minute and you don't want the dog to be jamming the window, that's, that's an option. Yeah. I myself, I teach the dog you're not allowed to jump on the furniture unless there's an invitation. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in control of the furniture because it's really my furniture. But if they jump on it, in their eyes it's their furniture, it's their house, it's their window. For whatever reason, if they were protecting you or we gave them too much power too soon, it doesn't matter. We're just clearing the slate, starting fresh, not worrying about what we did yesterday, teaching new behaviors. Okay. That's going to be huge for these dogs because you're going to find that dogs are really going to have a really great experience with this process. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Terrific. All right, so let's move on to the next thing. Don't give your dogs power. Wow. Yeah. Tell you what to do. Pet me, take me out, do this, do that. You know, you ever seen people that ring, uh, folks that leave jingle bells on their doors in order for the dogs to tell them to go outside. Really what they're doing is rewarding negative behaviors. Never put bells on a doorknob unless you're elderly or handicapped. Yeah. Otherwise, you should know when your dog has to go to the bathroom because the average dog has to go outside, you know, four or five or six times a day. They don't need to go out 20 and, and, and they need to go more than two or three. Yeah. Okay. Rule of thumb, got two potties in the morning, afternoon, early evening, after a meal, before bed. Done. Yeah. If you're feeding the dog in a structured fashion, yep. putting the food down for 10 minutes and so I forth. I even do water down because she drinks and then she she has to go. Yeah. If she drinks, she goes out 20 minutes after that. And then, you know, if she does have accidents, and it's usually my fault because I got tied up. Like yesterday, I was holding laundry and I totally forgot that she had water and she went in the house. You know, she's got a very... Well, it used to be like it's very small. Small, but, you yeah. know, she could. Uh, there are dogs that yeah. that don't have developed ladders, and so it's yeah. That and, and we generally learn that through f trying to figure that out. Now, if your dog has not been taught how to hold, because they're either being taken out too much, that's a problem too. Yeah, no, she's um, she's she's created eight to twelve. My boyfriend comes home at twelve and lets her out, and then she doesn't. She's created twelve to five. Right, so she's yeah. safe and she can hold. So we yeah. know when she's at rest, she can hold. Yeah. Now we just have to work on when she's active. Yeah. So that's fine. Okay, so terrific. Don't give the dog power. They don't tell you what to do and when to do it. You should know what a dog needs. 
Yeah. It's like a child. We don't have to have a baby screaming for an hour to realize it needs a bottle. <laughs> you yeah. know, that example. Yeah. That's really, really important. By the way, we are talking about foundational learning here. Um, foundational learning is like foundational in anything that you do for the very first time. It's a generally temporary thing that we do in order to set the stage for all the other things we're going to do for the life of a dog. Mm -hmm. For example, I love this metaphor that if I was going to build a home, I would dig a hole, pour concrete, and then starting to build a foundation. Mm -hmm. Now if you think about, I'm in a situation where most of the times so I'm coming and the house is being repaired all the time but never fixed, and I determine that the house is not sitting on foundation. And now my recommendation is to pick the house up, move it over, dig a hole, pour concrete, bring the house back, repair the damage, and then create maintenance for the life of the house. Well, that's almost like what we're doing with dog training. Yeah. Or in this case, behavior training. Yeah. Teaching about behaviors, not necessary commands, mm -hmm. even though they can play a role. So whatever you've done up to this point, that's good, we'll keep. And everything that you're doing that's creating the problem, we're going to eliminate. Okay. We're going to build that foundation. Your dog's going to adopt that. That's going to be the new life. Using the cage will be, more often, will be the new life. Temporarily using an indoor training leash that he drags around will be new yeah. for the dog. And you'll know as the days, weeks, and months progress when you'll need it or how long it needs to be or if you'll need it at all, right? Mm -hmm. Every dog's behavior is going to progress better if you're always on top of things. Yeah. It's when we kind of turn our backs and a behavior problem happens and reward it. So you not only have to catch the dog in the act, but you can't let the dog exhibit negative behavior when you're not there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to the no list. Another thing that I don't like is when I eat food, clean food, prepare food or snack, I don't like my dog near me. Yeah, no, we don't do that at all. And she, I don't even let her in the kitchen. Good. There's the barrier where the tile is. I go like this and get out. And she, I don't. See, I don't really play that game. I don't that play is the a, whole. Like, that is oh, good. Oh. That's very good because a lot of people fall prey to that. They feel bad for their dogs. It's all about feelings. Because she needs, she needs a very alpha, and I completely understand that. And that's why I'm really trying to do everything. I yeah, she just needs her. boundaries and structures yeah. to roll. So I would say to you, you can put her in a crate. You can give her a command to go to her place where she has to hold more than I would just put her in a room. Because in the room, she's not really doing anything. Yeah. In other words, if she's out, she could be in a learning mode. Like, for example, I would sit down to pretend that I'm eating and snack. Mm -hmm. And I would teach my dog to go into an open crate and stay there for five or ten minutes. Or go to a particular bed or a place or a mat to stay there for five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Or go into an area to stay just in the area. Why well, I could observe them, but they're not near me. Yeah. Now, the reason behind that theory is that we know that when dogs uh, eat food that are more dominant, they never allow a weaker dog near them without being aggressive or going after them or biting them. Mm -hmm. So anytime the alpha female male in the group is eating food, they don't share that with a weaker dog. Yeah. So there's a pecking order or an order of positional authority whoever that is in the yeah. pack. So in this space, we're just the kind of the dog to our dogs. And we give them black and white information. We don't reason with dogs. They don't reason or really care about any of those things. They just, it's all black and white. Am I allowed to do it all the time? Or am I not allowed to do it? And it shouldn't be ever. Yeah. Just kind of be one or the other. That's really huge. So if you're eating and you have your dog away, that's a great thing. And you want to tell that to your family or friends. You want to make sure everyone is aware that when we eat, no dog. The easiest yeah. thing to do is to do an exercise or put the dog away instead of putting him in a room or behind a, 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 a pet gate. Next thing on our list, no furniture. Never let my dog off the ground. We're guilty of the yeah, we're all we guilty. Are. And I kind of knew that because if your dog is showing signs of aggression, it has some power. Yeah. Where is it getting the power? One of the places is it's allowed on your furniture. Yeah, That's something that. we don't want you to do. So one of your training exercises is when you invite the dog out, the dog's on his little shirt leash, either lead the dog to the furniture and create the repetitions, and you'll probably need three, four, or five of those before the dog gets it, mm -hmm. or drop the leash on the ground and wait for the dog to exhibit the behavior of jumping, which is called capturing. Mm -hmm. When the dog does it, we mark it. How do we mark it? Through our mouth or our sound, through our behavior or our ability to follow through and get to that dog's leash. Mm -hmm. 
and the physical contact of the learning experience where the dog would be feeling the leash or if it was a pleasurable thing like praise or reward they'd be feeling the petting or so on and that's really crucial it's easy to stand back and say no 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 to your dog and repeat empty commands it's different to say no and get up and get to that dog's leash because if the dog sees that you're following through then there's power behind that which tells the dog that you're in control and really you're supposed to be in control of everything. Yeah. I had to learn that hard lesson myself. <laughs> my dog took a percentage of control and that mm -hmm. was just bad, bad on my behalf. Um, no roughhousing. Yeah. Throwing the dog yeah. around. No yeah. tug of war. All those things to promote aggression. Playing rough. Getting crazy with the dog. Look, I have a tendency to have moderate to low play in the home. Some people don't do any play. My wife would prefer that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do my, my majority of my big play, my fun, exciting play, is always outside. So my dog associates the big plays outside and very small plays in the home. You know, rolling the ball, she brings it back. Or uh, hiding the ball, she has to find it. You know, playing fun games or training games in the house and all that. I love that stuff. Uh, I love to be proactively involved with my dog's training. It's not always about bad, bad, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. But we seem to be so good at telling our dogs they can do everything and very poor at saying, hey, there is some boundaries here and we need to follow through. So if we can create a balance in that scale and say to the dog, hey, there are things you can never do and things you can do, and I'm never going to let the two meet. Yeah. I'm going to make sure that we're consistent because your dog will adopt that and that will be a new habit. Okay, No total freedom out of the cage. Like I said, it's good to have your dog in the crate. For everyone that has a cage, they should be using it well. Two to three times a day, your dog should be put away. Does the dog know five minutes or an hour? No. But is it good for you sometimes to give your dog a mental break so you can do other things in your home? Paperwork, I do it to get clean. a mental break. Yeah, oh, yeah, here we go. really annoying me. I put her in there. You know, or even bark, families. Bark, 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 bark. Sure, she's obsessively barking. One of the things I would love for you to do is make a list of all the things that she does, starting from the most important things you don't like to the least important things that okay. you would really like to address. Because what will happen is you will work with the minor things first and work up to the major things. Because the time you get to the aggression towards other people mm -hmm. or any obsessive behaviors, the dog has already had a heads up of training. Hey, mom. This kind of looks like teaching me not to jump on the couch or not to scratch on the window or not to chew on the furniture. It's that scenario. Always kind of pick and choose your fight. Okay. Don't overstimulate the dog and don't try to train the dog for five hours. Yeah. Pick a time, train, give the dog a chance to relax or put the dog away and repeat that all throughout the day. It's almost like you sending your kids to school and they go into class for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then they get a break and then they have another class break, another class break, another class break, and all, all throughout the day. Dogs need the same thing. And unfortunately, we, dog owners, me too, wasn't doing that. Just let my dog go all the time and put my dog in the crate when I go to bed yeah. or when I uh, go out shopping. That's not what crates are really for. That's a time that you can use the cage, but the cage is such an amazing temporary tool that you can really allow the dog to have total, total learning by having them in and out for learning experiences. Okay. All right, so that's going to be helpful. Also, no total space in the house. I think your dog can earn the privilege if a family says, hey, Bob, I want to give my dog the free reign of the whole house. I want him to earn that privilege. Great. Then let's not jam him into college when he's in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Earning... The privilege is the key word here. They have to earn privileges. Okay, they can't just get stuff. If they do, they're like spoiled children that are terrible adults. Yeah. They need to have structure. They have to earn privileges. If the dog is great because you're great, they're going to get more stuff. But if the dog's bad, it's not because you're great. There's something that you and I are doing wrong. But yeah, we have the baby gate over there so I can, so if she's, I can, so I can see her. Right, so she can't otherwise wander she upstairs. Or otherwise she goes downstairs and she's eating cat litter or getting herself into trouble somehow. Exactly. <laughs> now, I also talked to you about the importance of, I believe, uh, about using different tools. I'm perfectly fine with people using training aids. I hear it all the time. Oh, Bob, I don't believe in this thing and I don't use this thing and I don't recommend this thing. I'm like, why? Did one hit you on the head or is there a problem? You yeah. know, what happened? What what bad occurrence did you see or did you hear about that turned you off about any given particular tool? I can remember 30 years ago, I could barely get somebody to use a training crate in one of my classes. I'd have 20 people in a class. I would ask them to raise their hand. 
How many of you are using a cage? I'd get one or two people out of 20. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I'd be surprised if I don't have every hand going yeah. up. You know? Because now the education has gotten there. We understand that crates are not a bad thing. Whether yeah. they're used for the life of the dog or they're temporary, use them well. It'll benefit you. Uh, people using invisible fences in the home, people using different leashes and collars, as long as they're used correctly. I, I, I don't throw raw hides out in the trash because a dog got sick or got hurt or even died. Mm -hmm. I try to figure out what dog are good raw hide candidates. The other ones that are not good, no raw hide. Or greenies, or Buddha bones, or any other product out there. I just mm -hmm. don't throw everything out just because of a situation, because I believe each situation is unique. And that's important for you to understand. Yeah, no, okay. I agree. All right, so moving on here. Don't let your dog off a leash, outside or inside. So we're talking about having your dog trail a leash, training leash in the home. How cool is that? Right? They're mm -hmm. used to, they, after a couple of weeks, they get used to trailing your leash. I've had people that had to go out and buy little metal leashes because their dogs were chewing them. Now, of course, I have a concern the dog's going to chew metal, mm -hmm. right? That's not good. Yeah. But how clever could we be to, to maybe protect that? You know, wrap something around it like uh, tape or a material. Or I've had people say, oh, Bob, I've used duct tape. It worked great. Oh, Bob, I used electrical tape. It worked great. Oh, Bob, I put shrink tube around it. Or, or I bought a leash that had a metal nylon um, cord weaved through. It was kind of decorative leash, and it did well. And after a couple of weeks, I was able to use a regular piece of cotton or nylon leash that I had in the house. Just use common sense. No leash on the dog in a cage, and no leash on the dog if they're unattended. The leash is for you to give the message to the dog that when you're out, I need to be in control of you, and you're not holding the leash. But if somebody knocks on your door and your dog goes over there and she gets all charged up, you can either step on the leash and open up the door to see who it is, yeah. or you can put the dog away. You know, you can control the dog, and once your dog gets used to you being in control 100% of the time when you're out of the crate, wow, that's going to make a huge impact, guaranteed. So that's the oldest okay. trick in the book. I did it back in the early 80s, mm -hmm. accidentally, because I was putting my dog through off-leash training. And off-leash training really meant that we were dropping our leashes on the ground and we weren't holding them. So I guess it should have been called hold the leash training, drop the leash training, shorten the leash training, and then no leash training. Mm -hmm. And then from there we'd transition to other training aids to help us with our dogs off a leash. Yeah, All right. I would love to try that. It's cool stuff. Next one, no commands unless you've been taught and you have the ability to follow through. I can't tell you how many times I used to tell my dogs this, that, and the other thing when the dog really didn't know it, which meant that the dog didn't have hundreds of repetition of that in each phase of learning. For example, a phase of learning without distraction would be a learning phase. Mm -hmm. Hey, we did 50 repetitions without distraction. Now we're going to take the dog outside in the backyard and do the same training exercises with a little distraction and build it up to bigger distraction and more and more and more. Some dogs can't handle training under a level 10 distraction. They can do five, yeah. but they can't do 10. So determine what your dog can handle. Don't take your dog from a level one distraction into a level 10 and think they can get it. They need to go through the same repetitions as you would learn in a learning phase. Okay, which is a first phase of learning without distraction. And if you do give your dog a command and you don't follow through, you've rewarded a bad behavior because you didn't follow through. So if they say no and you don't follow through, you've rewarded a negative behavior. You gave them power. Mm -hmm. How many times do we tell our dogs not to do things or to come here or, or sit down or all these other commands and we don't follow through by making them do it? Or at least teaching them how to do it. Actually, I guess, if you teach them how to do it and you've had a lot of repetitions, then you give a command and they say no, they're rebellious, like your dog may be a strong-willed dog, no big deal, just go over and follow through. doesn't matter, as long as you always get your way. That's the most important thing. I think when I work with dog trainers and professionals, one of the things that I focus on is their ability to time their behaviors when a dog is doing good or bad, so timing the mark of a good and bad behavior, their ability to follow through, their ability to know multiple dog training techniques and styles, and how to use all the different types of training tools that we use to train a dog, and be well versed at them to try to determine what given tool is the best tool in any given situation. Very, very important, and I think you should have that same information coming to you as well. Don't have your dogs tell you what to do. Mom, 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 mom. <laughs> You know, it's one thing the dog has to go to the bathroom, great. 
But if your dog went to the bathroom an hour later saying, Mom, Mom, take me out, or Mom, Mom, pet me, Mom, Mom, I want this, or this is my, my, uh, my object, you're not allowed to, to, to have it. One thing I also don't normally like to see is uh, leaving all of our toys everywhere. What I didn't realize that when they were scattered everywhere, the toys became less important. When I left the dog's food down all day long, it became less important. When I had the dog out of the crate all day long, there was no value or structure. They couldn't figure it out. Just because you're a kid's in a library, that doesn't mean they can figure out how to read. So what I would do is I would take all these toys, I would put them away in a basket, and I would bring a toy out and engage and fond and play and training and all this cool stuff. Mm -hmm. When we were done, I would say to the dog, okay, we're done, take the toy away, and I'd put it, put it away, and we were done. And what happened is the toys all became more important and more valuable. How cool is that? Yeah. Otherwise, if they're laying out everywhere, it's possible your dog will start picking up your stuff, your clothing, your furniture. Because, you know, it's like, I love chocolate, but if chocolate's spewed up everywhere in my home, I probably won't care about it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever hear the expression, don't work at your favorite restaurant? Yeah. Makes sense, doesn't yeah. it? We want to create a value system in the dog's life that everything that we do is valuable and okay. important. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so let's move on here. No grazing. I'm sure your dog might not have a grazing issue. Food down for 10, oh, remove yeah. the food. Yep. <laughs> she knows that. Yep, let the dogs get that. And that's only because of her potty issues where same thing. She eats, she has to go in an hour. Yep, that's, that's her way. And I would probably say a one-year-old dog should be getting fed twice a day. Yep. I would probably feed her about 30 to 40 percent of her total feeding in the morning after all of her first potty, play, activity, all that stuff, and then feed her. Okay. I feed my dogs usually between 8 and 10 o'clock at night, in morning and nighttime. It's generally as a rule of fun. I never feed my dogs when I eat my dinner, when I eat my lunch, or I eat my breakfast because that hurts their digestion path. We want dogs to be able to eat food to eliminate and know when they digest food. So maybe taking a journal of what your dog is doing every day or every time you do whatever you're going to do will help you get a better sense of how he's digesting his food or how the dog is um, eliminating or when he's limiting. So you think about it, um, creating a journal is a simple way to allow us to know exactly what's happening with our dog's behavior every day. And after three days of journaling, you can look at that and say, wow, my dog went to the bathroom ten times a day but only really emptied four. So it probably only needs to go four the next day, approximate the same times, and so on. Okay. You know, yeah. like you said, your dog eats food at an hour and needs to go to the bathroom. That's your dog's body clock. Yeah. Knowing your dog's body clock is half the battle, I think. Really. Yeah. Knowing your dog's body clock, knowing exactly when it needs to drink and eat and whatever. For example, another thing. I take my dog outside to play. And they come in, they're all hot and, and, and tired and everything else. The first thing they want to do is drink a gallon of water. Yeah. So what I do is I... I will bring the dog over to my side, step on the leash and relax the dog for five or ten minutes or I'll put him into his crate and let him relax for five or ten minutes. And I find that dogs drink an awful lot less water just because I give them a chance to warm down and settle before they come in because they really can't control themselves. Yeah. I was once told that you lead a sheep to a field, they'll eat themselves to death. You have to control that. Yeah. You know, that's what the I shepherds out there. Not necessary. Sometimes the shock of very very cold going into a very hot body oh, really? that's 102 degrees yeah she'll drink her whole bowl and, I, and we slow it down with ice cubes but I, I have seen obsessive compulsive behaviors with ice cubes dogs jumping up the ice cubes every time you get ice cubes for your own self they're running in expecting ice cubes and now they have this ice cube fetish yeah not necessary I've talked to enough vets that said, Bob, tap water, room temperature is great for a dog. Think about how warm their body is. Yeah. Right? Way warmer than ours. So settle the dog down first before you do anything, especially feeding. Always understanding that after food, there's potty and there's rest. Three or more hours. Okay? okay. If I feed my dogs at 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock at night, they're, they're, if they go to bathroom, great. They're, they're going to bed. I'm going to bed. And I'll see them in another eight or ten hours later. Yeah. Okay. Very good. That's also another one of my questions for you is how much, um, how hard I should exercise her. Because I get worried because she's so little. Yep. But I ride, I go on a bike ride every morning and she, uh, she rides, she runs next to me. And I only go for like 15, 20 minutes, but you know, I, I would go longer if 
she, if I thought she could handle it. I just don't know with her little body. That's a great question. I got a lot of people that ask me, Bob, what's up with the exercise thing? Everyone has an opinion about exercise. My feeling is this. I don't exercise my dog to wear him out to control their behavior. I believe in exercise. I think if you get exercise at least two to three times a day for 10 to 20 minutes, you're going to be doing great. Yeah. Don't think you need to do an hour because remember, if you exercise your dog too much, you're strength training your dog only yeah. to need more exercise, to need more exercises, and so on. Yeah. So there's such a thing as over-exercise or under. Oh, okay. Whatever's going to be natural for you for the next 10, 12, 15 years, that's what I would recommend. Yeah. My sister, she used to take her dogs for five walks a day because that's what she did. Mm -hmm. And those dogs got used to that. But I wouldn't take a dog walk for five miles and then skip a few days and then let it go out for 10 or 20 minutes and then, uh, you know, and then take the dog out for another three mile walk and then not do, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, definitely. Be consistent with exercise. Your and dog. It seems to make a big difference with her, it really does. Sure, and, and, it, and it will. I do believe dogs yeah. need exercise, but I've worked with dogs that are sitting by the person who's in a wheelchair, yeah. you know, who's a service dog or a therapy dog. You know, so dogs adapt to their environment. I've seen hyper dogs that live in apartment buildings who do just great because they go through behavior training. Yeah. We teach them how to behave. We teach them through our commands and our routines and structure and all these things that we're talking about today. And they do just do dandy. Okay, good. So okay. how much does a dog need every day? No one can really say that. My rule of thumb is two to three times, 10 to 20 minutes. A ball throw, a ball throw in the yard can be probably just as good or better getting her heart rate up than it is taking for a walk around the block or whatever. She seems to love running. Like a walk she just doesn't do it yard? for her. Yeah, but she she really seems to enjoy the bike because she runs full speed. And, you know, she's just like running with the wind. And I'm surprised how fast I'm pedaling. And she's just loving it. You know, some if she can handle it yeah. and, and, and you've built up incrementally slow you know yeah you know, then that's fine i wouldn't overdo it i wouldn't do it when there's a lot of humidity yeah, no, i ride her pace i just got her the the, the gentle leader the head excellent head collar. um but i'm not sure if i have it on correctly so I was well you know if you some show me. yeah i can show you okay. and as a matter of fact i can even give you my dvd on how to use the gentle leader the gentle leader is a great tool for your dog. I always recommend the deluxe models that have the felt stitching. Okay. And yeah, um, she doesn't like the nose piece at all. No, you put the gentle leader on the dog. I, I practice all my practice for the first three or four days in the home. Uh, I don't rush the gentle leader on the dog outside. I just get him used to wearing it, then get him used to walking, running, jogging. I would probably say that the gentle leader I would not use for the bike. I'd use, I would actually use harness. A body she harness, pulls. and I don't like her pull. I don't like her pulling me on the bike. Granted, talk about the bike setup that they oh, yeah. have. Then you're going to have a safety. So there's, there's, there's. We can talk about that okay. later. I hear what you're saying because yeah. the general leader is great when you're in control, but it's got problems too. Yeah. There's, there's issues with it, but I really love it. I'm sold. I was a skeptic with the gentle leader. <laughs> I really thought it was a gimmick and it was mm -hmm. a joke, but if you think about it, a, a head collar for a dog is no different than a, a head collar for a horse or a cow yeah. or a sheep, you know? Yeah. You control it's your head, you're in control. control. Right. So I, I, I would love to help you there. Okay. Um, don't have people tell your dog what to do and give your dogs treats to be their friends. I've seen a dog get a treat from your neighbor and turn around and bite their hand that they've just been fed. Not a good idea. You don't need to try to bribe people to be your dog's friends. Oh, okay. Right? That's not how, oh, my dog doesn't like you. Here, give him food. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Dogs can take your food and bite you, just like yeah. they would in a pack. They'll take food from a weaker dog and they'll bite them. Multiple commands for one word commands. This was another one of my problems. Think about it. Dog makes a mistake, jumps on the furniture, your boyfriend says get down, your mom says off, you say no. Which is it? Yeah. Pick one word that you're going to use for your no word, whether it's no or any other sound for that matter. Um, don't say no unless you're willing to follow through. And so don't over no, 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 no. Sometimes we over no. That's really important. Multiple commands, come, 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 ah, 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 no, 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 no. All those things, you want to avoid that. I think okay. that's a common habit for human beings, especially those who have children. I find myself doing the same thing with my grandkids. <laughs> ah, don't you go near that. <laughs> we do that with our dogs. We'll say come five times. Yeah. Okay, say come once. They don't come, go get them. Yeah. You say sit one time, they don't sit, sit them. 
you know, if you haven't been taught how to do it, glad to teach you. Okay. Getting down to the very end here, don't give the dog human objects like pillows, blankets, sneakers, or anything that you own because they'll own and smell your stuff. Don't give your dogs treats for nothing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people give their dogs treats for nothing. It creates behavior problems. Treats are for operant learning, to build and to help them learn something for the very first time. If you keep on giving your dogs treats, you're just keeping them in kindergarten. If you give your dogs treats for no reason, it serves no purpose. It doesn't have value. If you want a dog to learn something and using food as an operant tool, you want to eventually get away from the food and use praise. I have trainers doing a great job with their dogs, but they're, they have a sack of food everywhere they go. They cannot tell their dog what to do without food. And yeah. if without it, they're, they're naked. I don't like that. I don't like that either. I think food is a great source of learning operantly and, and through all the different phases of training. But man, oh man, if you're still using food to train your dog, that's a pet trick. Yeah. You know, anybody can do that. I can teach a dog how to sit for a cookie. Can you tell them to sit without using a cookie? Yeah, agree. And will they yeah. hold the sit without breaking? You know, that's more impressive to me. All right. So I can, I can ask her to sit and not reward her with a treat. That's correct. In this case, it wouldn't be asking because if asking means she could say no. Oh, You're okay. telling your dog to sit. It's a command. Sit. This is what I want. If the dog says no, then okay, no problem. Make him sit. No big deal. I don't think we really make our dogs do anything, really. And when we do, they get angry at us because we're telling them what to do and they look at us as if we're the servant in the home. Yeah. Hey, who are you telling me what to do? I'm the boss here and this is my home and you're my servant. That's what most dogs, I've had a child psychologist saying, hey, that's what kids are doing nowadays. We're trying to appease their, every, uh, their desire and trying to entertain them all the time. That's not what it's supposed to be like. That will help you a lot in your the training. The thing um, with her, with the sit, I, th I think that she, she she won't sit all the time. She has, um, she might have hip dysplasia. She clearly has something wrong with her hips. Um, then don't sit her, or don't yeah, worry about sitting. She doesn't sit. If she does sit, she hovers, or she does beside sit. She will not sit on her butt. Well, if she's sloppy sitting, and she does have an if you were the hips, then running would be out of the question. Really? Because that's what's going to hurt those hips. She just does the lazy sit. I thought, it, oh, I didn't maybe it's just Maybe it's just because she hasn't been taught how to sit properly and what that sit looks like. For me, maybe. I don't really care how a dog sits. When they sit, they sit. So what I do is I teach the dog to sit, so let's say I do three, four, five repetitions. I show them what the picture looks like and they get rewarded. Then I give them a command to test them to see if they've responded. So I teach, I test. I teach, I quiz. I teach, I test. I teach, I quiz. And that's how I do it. I never go up to a dog and put a food over his head and say sit and then he sits and give him a reward. Yeah. If that's all you do, then the dog's going to be sitting down every five seconds to get a reward, yep. and they're going to have their hiney on the ground for a moment in time. Yeah. We always, like, trainers are always trying to expand the dog's ability to sit, for, not only for a long period of time, but for long distances. And if a dog knew how to sit, without using a leash, one command, one action, nothing else until I release the dog. Now, I have watched my dog sit on her own for an hour. Bob, that seems awfully harsh. Not at all. I've, I've literally watched my dog sit on my property, <laughs> I go to my next door neighbors, I'm yapping for an hour, and then my dog's sitting in the same spot watching the whole time. Yeah. So my dog can sit herself for an hour. Now, do I do that? Of course not. But to prove a point that if a dog knows something, you say it, they perform it, end of story. Okay. Otherwise, they probably really don't know it yeah. if they can't perform it. Okay. No dog parks. That can be a problem because dogs can develop bad learned habits and there's very little or no accountability in a dog park. Right? You Take your like dog, dog park? not a dog park guy. Take your dog to a dog park. He's learning bad habits from other dogs. You bring him home, he's bringing his stuff into your home. It's like the lady says to me, Bob, my kid was perfectly fine until he met Johnny. Now he's got a bad foul mouth and he's doing this and doing that. Yeah. Same thing happens at the dog parks. Dog parks have very good intentions. And if we, could, if we could develop private dog parks so dogs could go through a training process and develop a, a better behave attitude in the park and have somebody in the park who's the trainer or the, the caregiver that would be watching the dogs and controlling the situations, you'd be better off. 
So if you send your dog to a dog park and it's doing bad habits and then you come home and you try to say, well, we have some more boundaries and structure here. If your dog could talk, you'd say, well, wait a minute, Mom. You just let me do whatever I wanted to do an hour ago. Now you're telling me I can't do that. Okay. I was crazy there and I was wild. I was out of control. I was this. I was jumping. I was... Right. Most of the times we don't even have any control over our dogs. We tell them to come and they say no. Yeah, and we right. can't follow through because there's no leash. Yeah. You can see, I can go on with that yeah. one. I just want to let you know I'm not a big dog park guy. Okay. Okay. Neither is my boyfriend. He Neither is about 98% <laughs> of the trainers I've ever talked to. I mean, we, I, we haven't gone in a while because the last time we were there, there was a, a very mean little poodle there. And I was astonished that they had even brought the dog to the right. dog park because she had no... That's Social right. Skills at all. That's right. No accountability. Your dog gets mauled by another dog. Oh well. Yeah. Too bad. We'll make sure they don't come back to the park again. Well, my dog chewed up. Who wants that? Yeah. And I was only bringing her there to run, but the dog uh, the dog park is the same size as our backyard, to be honest. And now that I've gotten her biking, which seems to she seems to like. Hey, look. You know what I used to do? Um, take my dog to literally fields in the rainy days, tennis courts, to fenced in areas. Uh, actually, what I do a lot of times is I'll put my dog on a 60-foot leash, attach it to a collar or a harness, take the dog to a park, in the open space park, in the middle of the park, throw the ball and have fun. And my dog couldn't even run away if it wanted to. Why would you put them on a leash, though? You didn't have dogs that would come on pub? No, because I'm in a public location. All dogs must be leashed. Uh, a 60-footer okay. gives me enough power that if she were to run away or, or do something wrong, it's very easy for me to chase a leash. Yeah. I can immediately get to the dog. So it just puts her in a situation when she's in the training mode that I have total control over her because it's no different than trailing and leashing the home. It's yeah. a short, small environment compared to a large environment, a longer leash. Okay. Take my dog to the beach, sees another dog, wants to run away, no problem. I just say the dog's name, step on or grab the leash, and the dog learns that every time I say her name, she has to stop. Okay. So pretty soon I have the ability to stop her verbally and I don't need to touch the leash. But that's a good safety, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Dog's yeah. running towards the street, grab the leash. When I have her out front from gardening or something, I put her on a 20-foot, you know, so she can't she can't reach the sidewalk or the curb. People well, that's like a tie-out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Remember we said earlier, no tie-outs? Even if I'm, out, if I'm outside working in the front of the house, yeah, I, if you're, I bring her out with me. Yeah. Generally, if you're going to do that, you might want to have her tethered to you, be uh, attached to you where she can touch you and all that other stuff. Because if you're 10 feet away and you're gardening, she's with you, she's still being restricted. And that can be a little frustrating because if you ever see her going after cars and yeah. barking after, That's right? People. Right, you're seeing that. So she's telling you, look, mom, you're doing this for you. You're not doing it for me. This is frustrating to me. That can feed into a behavior problem. Like I said, many of these things I've done wrong myself, so it's all good. Not a big guy with carrying little dogs around. A lot of people have little dogs, they're carrying, they're carrying, they're carrying, and they have different behavior problems than the large 75-pounders. Why? Well, probably. We're not carrying the 75-pounders, but we're carrying the 20-pounders and the 15-pounders. And, you know, and, and we wonder why they're, they're aggressive. You go to, to say hello to somebody. You know, mm -hmm. Keep dogs grounded on the floor, yeah, not we're elevated. Not big hmm? we're not big on it's good. Either. It's good. You know, it's one thing you invite the dog up, it's one thing you invite the dog on the furniture. An invitation is direction. Yeah. But having them just doing it on their own, that's that's not good at all. No exercise after eating, we know that. So if you're going to exercise your dog, they should be empty. Yep. She gets breakfast when she gets back. And never discipline your dog too much or too little, because both sides of discipline is bad. I've seen people... Um, correcting their dogs, even trainers correcting their dogs more than they need to be corrected mm -hmm. and it's frustrating to me. There are a lot of training techniques back in the day, old school training techniques that I really really loved and believe that they are the best of the best. But there's also a lot of things that I learned back in the day that we did back in the 60s and 70s and 80s that were terrible. So I don't throw all training techniques because there's new training ideas. Mm -hmm. I selectively look at each training technique and evaluate it and try to find a place for it. End of story. So if somebody says, oh, Bob, you're so old school. Well, you know, a car is old school, you know, right? Built in 1908. You know, we don't yeah. have rocket ships to fly around the neighborhood, right? 
Yeah. It's, it, that doesn't make sense to me. Things aren't really old. If things are good, then use them. The wheel's been around for a long time. It goes round and round and works great, doesn't it? Yeah. So I don't believe that just because there's a lot of new ideas and new things that we should just throw everything in the trash and adopt something new. I think everything should have value in its own place. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the three most common collars that we use for training, regular flat collar, right? Mm -hmm. or, or a safety collar or a martingale or a check choke type of collar. That would be the kind of your standard basic collar. Mm -hmm. Then we use collars for correcting dogs. That could be a check choke or a little plastic triple crown collar. It's like a little pinch collar, but it's plastic. It's more gentle, very good for puppies mm -hmm. or gentle or soft dogs or small dogs okay. sometimes. I'm not really a prong collar guy to begin with. However, I do believe that they have their place. So if they're going to be used, let's use them appropriately any given training experience. And then, of course, a collar for control. So my favorite collars are a regular flat collar and a control collar like a gentle leader, which is a head collar. Yeah. So what you need to do for your homework assignment is to put the gentle leader on your dog about five, eight, ten times a day for five to ten minutes at a time just in the house, hold the leash, let the dog do whatever it needs to do. Fight it, try to get it off, whatever it needs to do. Okay. When I give you the DVD, I want you to review the DVD and see if that helps you with learning about the gentle leader. Okay. Then, when I come back the next time, you'll have been able to use it a little bit. We've been able to dialogue a little bit about how your experiences are and I'll be able to give you some help over the phone or through an email about some of the things you need to start doing or stop doing. I'll help you understand how to adjust it properly. That would be the collar that you use anytime you're holding the leash. If you're out for a walk, if you're having company come in, if you're taking your dog to the vet, basic training, that's the collar we're going to use. Okay. When you're not holding the leash, then you'd use those other two collars. I've seen dogs that you put a collar on, they behave great, you take a collar off, they misbehave. Better off leaving the collar on when you're home. When you're attentive, yeah. you can take the collar off. You're going to put the dog in the crate for a long period of time or any one of those things or you go to bed or go out to work. The collars are great, but man, oh, man, don't you misuse them. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm all for collars, but not abusing dogs with collars. I have a real problem with that. Okay. That's why I work with so many of these rescue organizations to help save dogs' life through proper training. Yeah. Okay? So we will talk about that, um, and we'll be done for our lesson. Okay. I hope you enjoyed today's audio dog training lesson. If you have questions in regard to this audio CD, please contact me at bobspetstop at gmail.com.